Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Career Journey Podcast. I'm your host, Brittany Avila. Today's episode features David Hennessy, founder of The Wonder Technique, which you can find at thewondertechnique.com. And The Wonder Technique is offers mini courses, podcasts, videos, blogs, books, worksheets, all about health, wellness, stress management, time management, all of those things that we really, really need help with. And in this episode, David and I talk not only about how he got to creating the wonder technique, how he started creating his own business around it, but we also talk a lot of just about how humans learn. We even got into a rant about how people learn new languages. We talk about people's ideas and conceptualizations and how we learn about health and wellness and so much more. So please enjoy David Hennessy. everyone, welcome to the Career Journey Podcast, where we explore exciting careers and how to get them from the people who flipped it. I'm your host, Dr. Brittany Avila. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Hope you can deal with my sense of humor as we move through this, but I really appreciate yeah. you bringing me on your show. And yeah, thank you. It's really cool especially the, the format and the fact that you, you did, ex, you're doing experimental psychology, right? Yep. Yeah. Because I, I mean, when I went through university in Simon Fraser in Canada, one of my best professors was an experimental psychologist. Like he was ahead of the curve. Yeah. Like he learned stuff that, you know, kind of pans out now in social psych and we can, mm -hmm. maybe we can touch on this during the podcast, which was just amazing. Like he, he, it was just, he predated stuff like, you know, when you can write on it nowadays, it's all oh, no big deal, but writing on a tablet, those sort of things. And he explained how, like, we have the third light on the back of cars from mm -hmm. perception psychology before that came out. He knew the history of before it came out, why they should be doing this and how in psychology through experiments and everything, Brittany, we, people come up with fantastic ideas, but by the time it gets into place in society, it can be multiple decades later right it's always amazing me like when when you read books um malcolm glad malcolm gladwell wrote us mm -hmm. several books that relate to psychology and when i read this stuff i went hang on a second here this is not new i read i learned about this 20 years ago but <laughs> when people talk to me how oh, have you read malcolm's book about xyz and i'm like yeah and they're like this is so incredible and it, it, it's, it's the gap it's the gap between great yep. ideas and one day we've arrive pardon me in, in society it's just amazing so i'm sure you're learning some pretty cool stuff yeah <laughs> trying to <laughs> oh for sure uh, well we can go ahead whenever you want i'll stop just chatting okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right well we start pretty easy i just ask whether you knew what you wanted to do when you were a child or if you had any ideas or conceptualizations of what you thought you might do when you were a child Okay. Hey, well, when I was a child, I was very, very curious. Still am really curious, Brittany. And part of that is the whole idea of learning about how things work. And when I first started out, that was geared actually much more towards the engineering approach as a young child. I used to take things apart, like a yeah. lot. Toy cars, electrical lamps. Maybe I shouldn't have done that sometimes when they're still <laughs> plugged in. Different things to see how things worked. And Originally, when I was a young teenager, because I was really good at working on vehicles, taking engines apart and rebuilding them, I thought I was going to end up at working in mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of took a, I wouldn't say it was a turnaround or, you know, some people nowadays in business say pivot. When yeah. I went to university, I took a class in psychology and I fell in love with psychology as to how the working of the mind works, and in particular, social psychology and how we apply things in everyday life. Mm -hmm. So there isn't really, sometimes for some people, 
a line of connection, but I do see that connection. I'm, I'm really good at pointing that out to other people when I chat with them, do some coaching, and that is to see where connecting the dots in people's lives. Sometimes people don't see the connection because you're, of course, you're immersed in your own life. Yeah. But I recognized for a long time that I had a great curiosity, and you can ask me a little bit more about it if, if you're interested. I have the ability to make complex things simple. And yeah. that's something that has really helped me in my work. Okay. Yeah. I would like to know a little bit more about that. When did you first notice that you could make complex things simple? Actually, it was probably a 10, 12 years of age when I started explaining to people, really, I drew a map of how turbocharged engines work, which is really strange for a kid <laughs> that age to be able to understand an internal combustion engine. Yeah. And because I was reading that when most people would be reading comic books, you know, in the, in, in every, and comic books are great, but I was just reading different stuff. Mm -hmm. It really came uh, to an, a point where I, when my mom was really sick, which is almost, uh, she had two belts of cancer, both many years ago now, over 30 years ago. And I went with her as, as my dad too, on most of the medical appointments. And my job was to help try and decode what she was hearing from naturopaths. Well, no, it, it wasn't my job. I, I just happened to end up doing this. Like right. she didn't ask me, I was there to give support and loving my mom very dearly. I thought, how can I help her manage the stress by making these decisions that they're telling her to do easier because when a person's going through a lot of stress, it's very difficult to make decisions and especially when it's complex. Yeah. So through that process, it was over a year. I, I kind of got an understanding that I could make scientific things easier to understand in everyday language. And then that was before the evolution of the winter technique, which started 20 years ago. I created 20 years ago was the whole idea of how can I bring information to people so that they can understand it easier. So wellness can actually be eliminated. in the fact that it's something that everybody, they get it. That's my goal. My goal is to have everybody have enough tools to understanding the core principles of health and wellness that it no longer becomes something people have to spend time in. When you know you're working on, on your wonderful career and you're working on you know, experimental psychology, you're not thinking, am I doing the right thing for my health and well-being? Because you got that down. Right. And uh, it's sad to say a lot of people are still working on that. And it's not sad, but it's, it's true because most things are made much more complex than they can be. And then sometimes people try and take shortcuts, which they really can't because as human beings, we've evolved over a long period of time and some of the habits that we have that are very beneficial, you can't hack out of the system. Right. You don't want to, whether it be sleeping or hydration or proper nutrition. People have tried to zigzag around that and <laughs> yeah. it's never really worked. I don't know. You can tell me a little <laughs> bit from, from your perspective. So I'm not too much dominating the conversation. I mean, <laughs> Do you find that things are made very complex when it comes to health and wellness or to the other end, so simple that you just don't see the connection. Tell me, what do you feel? I think for my own personal health and wellness um, journey, I think that it is very simple when you are actually listening to experts and people who are engaging in health and wellness every day. They usually, it ends up boiling down to something pretty simple, right? Exactly what you were saying, getting enough sleep, mm -hmm. getting enough hydration, exercise, eating mostly healthy. Yeah. But I feel like as a society, we make it more complex because of the reasons you're mentioning. We're trying to take shortcuts. We're trying yes. to be more productive in other ways. And therefore we can't devote as much time to sleep. Let's say sometimes mm -hmm. people have a hard time with that. Um, and so I think we make it more complex than it really is because we're trying to get there faster if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm listening to it. It's, it's a very good answer that you're giving because, and, and it's, it's like the question is trying to get there faster so we make it more complex. And isn't it, <laughs> it's just like, it's like throwing the GPS out the window because you think you're going to get there quicker and then you say, well, that's not going to help. Yeah. But it, it's, yeah, and, and I think that often the information, maybe you hear too from a lot of people, it's conflicting information. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
there's information that came out about nutrition and it's back and forth and back and forth. And you're wondering, and this is something that I look for, Brittany, which perhaps you've done in your own life, where I look for the, the common thread of information. And I'm blessed with the fact that I've been doing this for 20 years so I can watch the evolution. Like when I, when I started sharing uh, the wonder technique and I talked to people about the really the holistic approach, the impact of hydration on many parts of our lives mm -hmm. and the impact of nutrition. In other words, like if somebody is, is exercising, make it really simple. And they feel like, you know what? I really enjoy exercising. They've picked an exercise and this is really important that they really enjoy. Not because mm -hmm. their friends say you should go running. You should go do this. No, it's because they actually enjoy it. Like they're excited to do it. Yeah. To me, that's something I share with people. If you want to make a habit that you'll continue with, pick something you really, really want to do. Mm -hmm. Not that someone else, right? Oh, running is great for your cardio. Great. Do you like running? No. Well, then pick something else because there's right. lots of, you know, it can take time to find what you want, which is great. But sometimes, you know, right away intuitively, I don't like that, but I like this. Mm -hmm. So when you exercise, you have to pay attention to what you eat because you're breaking down muscles and you want to rebuild them. And on top of that, you have to, you can't exercise. Most people know this, but if you think about it, Every day, if you've exercised the same muscles, you're not giving your body the chance to repair. Mm -hmm. And then when you don't sleep effectively, uh, you're actually not giving your body the chance to clean out the breakdown of negative materials, materials your body needs to get rid of as a result you know, of exercise. And then when you exercise, your body needs to be properly hydrated. So all of these things come together and our peace of mind and our ability to live through our lives comes from inside our own minds and how we look at things. For example, some people might really enjoy a certain food, but they won't eat it because they believe that it might do something to them. Like it's, you know, I enjoy chocolate. And some people say, well, you can't eat chocolate because you can't be healthy if you eat chocolate. They have a frame <laughs> of reference right. that actually they fight with inside their mind. And you know, nobody's suggesting a neither mind it Every breakfast, lunch, and dinner, all you eat is chocolate. But if you have a resistance to doing something, you actually have an internal conflict and that takes away your peace of mind. Yes. So, so for the wonder technique is really looking and pulling things together and trying to remind people that all these things are interactive and our managing of stress, the effectiveness of our nutrition. I mean, oh, one thing I was kind of leading to in a zigzag way is when I started the wonder technique, there was research about sleep, but no way near as abundantly as there is now. Like Matthew right. Walker, who wrote, you know, Why Sleep Matters, he started his work 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the information now about how we hurt ourselves by not sleeping properly, as Matthew would say, you know, if you want to die younger, don't sleep that much. You know, right. if you want to have challenges procreating children, don't sleep that much. If you want to hurt your creativity, if you want to make it more difficult for your memory to function, reduce your sleep. And the hero's journey of not needing to sleep much is, came back to haunt a lot of people yeah. because they, did, they didn't realize it or they refused to accept it. And they stimulated themselves a lot to try and get over that need. But there's some remarkable things that exist. Uh, for example, adenosine is a chemical that builds up in our body during the day. It's, kind of, it's called sleep pressure. And then when we go asleep, we that pressure is released it's 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 like a ticking clock to the mm -hmm. point of exhaustion that you reach but you mess with this for example with a high dose of caffeine right. what it does have you do you notice the, what happens when you drink caffeine and end the scene what happens mm -hmm. okay so maybe just for anybody who might be listening to really say is that the 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 caffeine camouflages your ability to to understand that you're getting really tired and this is why when the caffeine finally wears off you feel like you've hit a wall yeah and you're going to feel like you're going to collapse and that's because you were always getting more tired but you've masked it by what you were doing in terms of your you know foods that you're bringing into your body hmm, interesting so, and how did you get into the wonder technique about 20 years ago? You said you started developing it. How did, mm -hmm. how did you yeah. discover it? How did you develop it? Well, it came after, after my mom recovered, you know what? I can't nail it down, but I'm pretty sure she shared that David helped me a little bit on my path here. And mm -hmm. I, I started um, hearing from people that were curious as to what I'd done. Now, I didn't have the wonder technique formulated at that time, yeah. and I didn't have the depth to it that I have now. 
and the evolution that's happened over the years. But what I did actually, you know, what happened, Brittany, is I wanted to remember everything I was learning. Mm -hmm. And I teach like a course now, how to improve your focus and concentration. And part of that is tools that I've learned over the years that other people use and that I use to help improve focus and concentration because I was not very good at being focused and concentrated yeah. and memorizing things. I mean, when I went through university, one way that I helped um, end up getting my degree in psychology was I used to make a lot of acronyms to remember things. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things that I realized with the wonder technique, if I want to remember certain things that I should do on a daily basis, if I can make it easier for me to remember, I can apply it. And then I, and then I started doing, and this was interesting, one of the first ever seminar I did was 160 people because most of my work has been in audience, with audiences and mm -hmm. conference work prior to what's happened in the last year with the pandemic. And prior right. to in the last year, it was only the first time I ever started doing podcasts because everything else I did was in person with thousands of people. And I, I realized that I was like a fire hose when I was presenting too much information and that people were, I don't know if you've ever been to an event where somebody speaks and they share a lot of really good info, Brittany, but you can't remember anything afterwards. Like you're impressed, yeah. <laughs> but you didn't retain. Yes. Right. I'm guilty, you know, I raise my hand here, guilty as charged. I, I realized that I like, I mean, I had, uh, you know, debt by PowerPoint. I had so much information, like pages <laughs> and stuff. No one could possibly comprehend what I was saying. And then I learned, hmm, I need to make this simpler to share with people. Plus something I didn't mention yet. I'm much more... Um, to use a simple term, introverted and extroverted. Yeah. And I was really nervous when I was sharing in front of people. So rather than lose track of everything, I needed to create systems to organize things in my mind. And those systems became the systems that I shared with people. So the wonder technique is not the same as someone else would go to university and, or college and learn a coaching program where there's certain formats that are brilliant and things. It's a completely different system. So okay. someone won't get the taste of it uh, by doing anything else. It's a system that I created. And, and so I built out lots of different things. Like, for example, I have another course on um, how to f find and follow your purpose. And I use, for example, there's, I use the word purpose as an acronym to help people think about, you know, for example, perceived dreams would be the first one. What is it that they dream about all the time? You know, you asked me, what did I dream about right. when I was a young kid? <laughs> I mean, and I, I could ask you that question, but it's like to people, what, what are you obsessed with? What do you really love doing? Not what other people do, but what do you really can't get out of your mind that you just really enjoy and you daydream about? That's like a little flashlight suggests you that this is what your life is all about. And another example from that would be you're, you lose track of time. Time is unrestricted when you're in, indulged in that topic. You wish you had more time. You're not like, oh God, I wish five o'clock would show up because I want to stop doing this. <laughs> yeah. So that's like your purpose is P-U or you know, P-O-S-E. Each one of those letters helps me remember when I'm sharing with people, but also makes it functional for people if they engage in the course to remember, okay, to kind of filter through their mind every day. Okay, what do I, am I really on track here or am I off track? So systems in place that make it easier for people to remember. I mean, you know what? Everyday systems are very simple. To-do list, right? A to-do list is a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, when we go shopping, a great idea is having a list, right? Because then right. you don't go, you go to the store and buy things that you didn't need and forget everything that you didn't want, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, making a list is very helpful to keep us focused as human beings. Mm -hmm. And then for health and wellness, I think the key is, is to kind of have simple tools that you can apply in your life that you could do at any age, because I've had the honor of working in schools where children were as young as six, with teenagers, with adults, elderly people, using the same protocols, using the same ideas, not changing them because of age, but making things simple enough that people can just bite into. Mm -hmm. So um, you can ask me for examples or whatever is interesting to you, uh, you know, I mean, I, I love sharing about what I call framing your day, but it's, it's a protocol that I developed to help people manage stress, but also to keep on track of what's important in their lives. But maybe that's not of interest to you. I know. I, it's up well, to you. actually, I was going to ask a question a little later, Yeah, exactly yeah. like that, because a lot of our listeners are college age students or mm -hmm. right out of college. Yeah. And that's a time where it seems 
very difficult to engage in wellness behaviors, or it's a time when you're trying to figure out exactly what wellness behaviors you should be engaging in. And so I was going to see if you had advice or examples for how to manage stress, like you were saying, and how to kind of come up with systems for maybe people at that time of their life where they're Mm -hmm. trying to figure that out, but feel like external pressures are maybe making it more difficult to do so. That is a great question. And the biggest challenge in that whole situation is what you mentioned is the external pressures. Yeah. You, and, and I'm going to frame this ahead of giving examples, Brittany, by suggesting that people, when you, you recognize that it's external pressures and you feel that you want to do something different, you have to take yourself and imagine going into the future five or 10 years and imagining if I follow this influence that's outside of me that I don't agree with, what is going to happen to me? So if you're listening to advice for, and you're, go, you're thinking, you know what, I want to go to university and I want to study, let's pick it. Well, we're talking about psychology. Let's pick psychology. Yep. But you're, everybody in your family is, you know, has no interest in how the mind works. And they're all very much interested in and everybody who does the following profession is going to hang up here or <laughs> turn off. But say if somebody's involved in accounting, they love working with numbers. It's completely different from, from yeah. psychology, except you're a statistician, right? So they, it, everybody's saying, you know, you should do this. It's a good job, etc. You have to imagine, you know, okay, so if I do this for five or 10 years, I go and I get my, you know, certified uh, accountancy program. I get all that done. Will I really be happy? What will it do for my life? Will this be what I want to do? And go to the future and look for the pain points and see, you know, do I really want to do this? Will I be happy? Would I want to do this? Or will it be, I'm trying to buffer my life outside my work with doing other activities. Another example would be, if you can't find a motivation to take care of your physical well-being, and you know what, Brittany, you know, this starts really young. It doesn't start when you're 40 or 50. It starts in your (laughs) 20s and 30s what you do to your body will have an impact later. So I say to people, you know, maybe you don't want to have children. Okay, that's fine. Maybe you don't imagine that you'll ever have grandchildren. But just as as an example, imagine that if you said, yeah, I'd love to be able to play with my grandchildren, you know, when I'm 70, 80 years of age. But if you don't take care of your physical well-being now, you won't be able to bend over, you know, because people, young people now have back problems. There's all kinds of things that crop right. up because we're kind of, we think over time it'll just be okay, but we have to start taking care of our health. So you look to the future and, and you give yourself personal motivation based upon something you want to avoid. Like in myself, like I learned the French language and I came to France. I didn't speak French at all. And my motivation was because my children always spoke French together because their mm-hmm. mom is a native French speaker. And I didn't speak any French. I couldn't understand what they were saying. And I, my frustration was, okay, if I let this go, sure, you know, eventually they'll, you know, over time, uh, they'll move out of home. It's no big deal. No, I was like, I want to understand those little conversations between the boys. You know, I want to right. know what they're saying and, and learn what are they talking about, you know, about their friends, not to be, as we would say in English, nosy, but just to, what's important to them because they talk, we talk about what's important. Yeah. So I gave myself a motivation by looking to the future and saying, okay. And I mean, I did the same when I had the back injury, when I fell and I couldn't walk for six months, I was lying on the couch thinking, do I want to give up all the hiking, all the experiences that I love by basically just saying, okay, that's it. I, I'm not going to be able to walk properly again, or I'm going to have an operation that from people I knew may not work out. So I look to the future. So perhaps people that, you know, listen to your work and people that you know and value what you're doing, you can take motivation from the future mm-hmm. because you've got to find the motivation because people won't do anything unless they have the motivation. So you pull that back to yourself. And then simple habits, like uh, we talked a little bit about hydration. <laughs> and, uh, and I think a lot of people, you know, understand hydration is important now. But yeah. the simplest thing, like right beside me here, I have a a bottle, a glass bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm at my home office. It can be or a stainless steel bottle. I'll use one or the other. But carrying it around with you yeah. will make it easier for you to keep hydrated. It sounds so simple, <laughs> you know. And, and I mean, when you buy bottled water, if you, if you want to push aside the environmental impact of plastic bottles, uh, which is not great. 
but you, if you buy water, it's much more expensive. But if you port your own water, it's available. And when it's available, you'll do it. So like it's, it's also the habit if you want to change your diet and, and eat what you know is better for you, you make the food available. It's a question of availability, mm-hmm. right? And if you want to um, work on a project like studying for school, uh, for, for course or anything, you actually you want to do something which is you, you control your environment, by, you know, it's like the simple thing on your computer, not having so many tabs open, having your desk clear, just having books for the topic that you're working on. And what I do is I will always have, you know, even in the modern world, I'll have pen and paper. And you know what? Pen and paper is not (laughs) making this up as we go. If something pops into my mind that I want to share with you later in the conversation, I will write it down. It stops my mind getting caught in that loop. And if you're working on a project, you know, you're working on, for example, Experimental psychology, I'm pretty sure you've got a statistics course somewhere in there, right? <laughs> yeah. And if, if you're thinking yeah. about, yeah, if you're thinking about, you know, different things, um, uh, you, okay, oh, yes, I just have that idea, but you're not working on the experimental stats course right now, write a note to yourself so you can keep focused on what you're doing. So you're kind of keeping that bandwidth that you have available mm-hmm. for you focused. And it's really, you take the, I like to use the mathematical idea of minus sign. You minus things out of your life to clear the clutter and make sure that you can be more focused. I mean, it's very common that people get very distracted from using their smartphones. And one of the simplest solutions is, is you make sure that the applications you use are only accessible on, for example, on the desktop, if you have a desktop. Right. So if you're notorious for going on social media and you don't want to be on social media so much, delete the apps. Just have it so that you're, when you're at your laptop computer or you're at a certain location and you dedicate a framework of time. So you, can't, you control your environment, mm-hmm. but you have to take the initiation and you have to find that motivation. And you may need assistance to help you find that motivation. It could come from a coach, but it could also come from people that are around you, that know you. you right. know, our best friends are, are the best guides often. That's what I tell students all the time is to get accountability partners or accountability yes. groups. It's the only way I get work done or yeah. writing done. I have to have kind of accountability groups where people are, they're not even actually holding you accountable. You just kind of think they are and it still motivates you enough to get it done. Exactly. Exactly. And you, if you, you can have someone else making you accountable or yourself yeah. and uh, pardon me for this. Well, I drink a little <laughs> bit of water. Okay. <laughs> With, um, for example, it helps us as human beings to install a, install a habit when you, you know, it's, it's true. You could do it digitally, but I think visually it's really helpful if you have a calendar and every time you, for example, you're making a new habit, it could be anything. It could be exercise program. It could be remembering to bring all your books to class. Like some people will forget to do that. Yeah. So every time you do that, at the end of the day, you put an X on the calendar. Yep. It's such a simple thing, Brittany, but it's like you, it's a sense of achievement. Look at that. I did seven days in a row. I remembered my math book that for, for weeks, I was always like, oh man, I forgot it. Those simple things. I mean, for me, uh, full disclosure here, I used to forget my keys when I would go out to school as a young kid and I would end yeah. up having to wait outside until someone else came home. So then in the mornings, I used to put my keys in my shoes that I was wearing the next day. So I couldn't forget them. They were in there or the shoe was very uncomfortable. So, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you make something that helps you remember what you're doing. And then you give yourself some sort of external way of, you know, saying, oh, okay, I'm doing this. Yeah. Yeah. I just started Excellent. marking off on my calendar last week for a writing habit that I'm trying to do. So it's Excellent. like, wow, this helps Brilliant. me keep like a street. Cause I know I started a language learning app for the same reason you're, you did. I started, I'm trying to learn Spanish because my young four-year-old is learning it in class and he's like, talk Spanish with me. And I'm like, I can't even speak basic words yet. And so I started that and it like has me do a streak to keep me using the app. Yeah. And I was like, that's a good idea. I should use that on my own and just X off on the calendar when I'm writing. Yeah, this sounds like Duolingo. Is it Duolingo? It is, yeah. Yeah, I've I've used, when I started trying to learn some French, um, because I learned a true conversation, I picked up some words. I mean, thank you to Duolingo for, that's a shout out to them, but really it's a (laughs) helpful one. And it does that, the idea of having you have a daily streak of what you kind of, you get that motivation if you need it to do it, but you have a beautiful motivation, your child. Yeah. 
you, it's the same thing like for me where I needed to learn French because I'm like, how can I communicate? And you're building a wonderful bond yeah. between you and your child because then it's something that the child's learning and you're learning. Yeah. And yeah. he loves, he loves watching me too. He'll come whenever he hears the app open, he like gets all excited and runs mm. over and watches for a minute. So it's definitely a relational bonding experience of learning together. It is. And I'm going to ask you a question on yeah. the language thing. How do you feel about acquiring languages? Do you think, cause I'm going to give you David's opinion, mm -hmm. which could be totally wrong um, mm -hmm. as to how we acquire languages over time. Do you, do you, some people always say, you know, young people, they get it really easy mm -hmm. and then adults, it's much more difficult. How do you feel on, about that? So there's multiple reasons for that. Um, one is that actually developmentally, we can hear different phonemes and different sounds at a younger mm -hmm. age that mm -hmm. we lose the ability to hear over time. So that's one reason that it makes it a little bit more difficult as you age is that mm -hmm. sometimes when you're really young, you can hear slight dialectical differences okay. that we just can't grasp. But the other aspect is that a lot of times we learn language kind of incorrectly. We try to teach it as like this very rote matter of fact, learn these conjugations, learn these things. And that's mm -hmm. not how we learn language natively. Like when we're children, yeah. we're immersed in it. They're learning because they hear it everywhere and they can't comprehend and they're tactile and they're figuring it out. And then when we're adults, that's not how we're learning it. And so if they've found that like language immersion th um, techniques, if you go to another country where they're speaking that language, you learn it a lot quicker because you're learning more like children learn where you're just surrounded by it and you're kind of picking it up more intuitively as you go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm listening to, and there's a third one I'm going to add here yeah. unless you've got more, but what you just said is it, especially um, the second one there with regards to immersion, mm -hmm. because we, you, said when we're, what, you don't say to your, did you ever say to your son, okay, I am, you are, he is like, who should be, yeah. this is why I don't speak any Gaelic. And I grew up in Ireland and I, you know, I was in school, how many years? Um, eight years with the Gaelic language. And I, 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 I have two sentences, right. That I might even be able to get yeah. like, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing them correctly. So out of that much time, because they had us memorizing poems and memorizing verbs and conjugation, but you're right, the application in life is not yeah. that way. And as we learn, like children, as they learn language, it's really, they're trying to piece together, make a, like a whole thing out of it. And they hear repetition and they hear people pointing out things and identifying them. That's a cup, that's an egg, that's a bottle. And mm -hmm. they make the relationship. So when I was learning, for example, French, if people said to me, you know, um, uh, your, the word, French word for car is voiture, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But you, I, I was able to hook into my memory the two words together. So mm -hmm. I built up a repertoire on that as basic language. Now, when pe it, the hard thing that I was not possible for me without any sort of knowledge of a language is just to throw me in and expect me to decode everything. Because then you're hearing words and it's, on, it's a mess. Right. You don't know how it is. Eventually, over time, you could. But the immersion thing helps uh, because I think there's two things going on. One, you're actively learning. And the other part is what I experienced in my life, where even if you're standing around people that are speaking French, your, your brain is incredible. Mm -hmm. you're picking up information. Like I say sentences in French that I didn't even know what they meant until <laughs> I'd after. I'd used them and people said, oh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I'm like, really? Because <laughs> I acquired information in the environment. Yeah. But the third thing I want to just put on the table here is that unfortunately it's something that we deal with as adults. We tend to say it's not possible for us yes. to learn the language. I'm too old. I don't have the ability. Our self-talk is very, very destructive. Yeah. And we also expect change to happen very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. But it's like building muscles. You don't build a muscle one day. You can't learn a language one day. You can't build a relationship in one day. It, nothing, all those, the hacking kind of systems is, I mean, sure, you could hack on a computer, but hacking life is not really, you know, what it's all about. And, and the pleasure of learning is taken away. But I'd say for languages, for me, the, the thing that came about was having the motivation uh, was key. 
and also recognizing that um, the commitment that I had, but also that I could do it. Right. You know? and, and I wasn't for, I, I, you know, I was embracing the experience. And I think that a lot of people can learn a lot of stuff, like people that go back to school when they're, you know, quote unquote, older, uh, whatever that means nowadays, right. a, you have the capacity to do it if you believe you can. Yeah. Well, and especially when society makes it easier to fall into those ideas of, oh, well, I'm just not good at math or adults don't learn language as easy as kids. So it's pointless, but there's even conventions for people that just love learning languages so much. They just learn as many as they can. Um, It's completely possible, but Mm -hmm. we kind of limit ourselves and we're, we just put ourselves in these boxes of, oh, I I don't know math. So I can't, you know, get an engineering degree because I don't know how to do math. And it's like, well, yeah. You can learn, but I like this idea of learning as an adult versus a child because it's what I study. I studied developmental psychology and learning. And ah, okay. yes. if we okay. if we learned more like children do, I think mm-hmm. that we would learn better because it's all interactive, it's play based, it's it's essentially how learning really happens. When we look at little tiny children, they're just sponges. They're learning everything because that's all they have, right? They kind of start at zero and they have to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like you were saying with language, we expect it to happen quickly. But if we think of children, it's not until around age three that they're kind of successfully putting sentences together Mm -hmm. coherently enough to kind of fully converse. I mean, obviously language happens a little bit earlier, but there's stages to it. They first learn a couple words, then they get to about 50 words, then 200, and then they have a different way of putting sentences together where they're kind of short yes. sentences mm-hmm. and then they finally fully kind of grasp the sentences and then you hear the common kind of mistakes that children make when they're trying to do like plural words or things like that and all the yes. funny things that happen from there yes yes and as adults i feel like we just don't allow ourselves that grace we don't want to mm-hmm. make those mistakes we don't want to mm-hmm. sound stupid if you will And so we don't let ourselves make those mistakes. But if we think about, you know, it takes a child three years to learn the basics of a language. Why do we expect that it'll take us a month or something to learn one? Yeah, exactly. Like I'll do, I'll do, you know, Duolingo for 80 days and I should know the language. And then of course you see the advertisements that say, learn a language overnight. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So, I mean, who, you know, how, how much depth is to it? And it's, it's the long game that you want to play in everything and not the short game. And so, yeah, I, I think that's really cool, your idea, like looking at the children. And what is it with children as well, too? They are so curious. As an adult, if you can stay curious, like they won't just look at a plant and walk by. They will stop. Mm-hmm. They'll smell it. They'll touch it. Like they'll really embrace the experience. You know, some children will draw a picture. They will, you know, they, they'll, they'll look and try and map it all out they will retain that memory because yeah. they've really worked on it in multiple dimensions, right? Our memory is not just visual, right? So as a, as an, anything that we want to learn, like, I mean, for me, it's years and years since I worked on cars, but I can explain how an engine works because I took them apart. Like literally, right. it's kind of like when you learn how it is and it's, it's amazing how we can apply that in our lives. Like you really dissect things. And yeah. You need, about. You need curiosity to curiosity to learn. Um, without curiosity, you're kind of just going through memorizing a bunch of things. I realize this yes. a lot with college students now because mm. our education system uses external rewards and mm-hmm. developmental psychology and cognitive psychology have both learned that external motivators are not the best for learning long term. Exactly. So they're really great for short-term effects, for getting children to behave the way you want to, for learning quick things or memorizing quick things, but eventually it erodes your internal motivation. And what we're seeing with the younger generations is it's increasing the anxiety that students have around learning. And now they're struggling so hard to get a certain grade that they've lost some of that curiosity. And so they're not necessarily learning as deeply as they could because they're not curious about the subject mm-hmm. and you have to be curious to, to keep going. <laughs> yeah. You really summed it up beautifully and it's the curiosity to keep going. And also I think to retain the information. Right. 
Yeah, because you you want to know about it. Like if yeah. you, what, that's the challenge, and it's it's not a good thing when in schools there's classes that are taught that they have a child has no interest in learning. Yeah, uh, and is they can't see the functionality of it. But if you can explain why, like math, for example, is really actually still very important for us to function as human beings, as well as the way it works on our brain and our mind in that. And a, a little bit of leverage that um, you, a parent can do, and I'm blessed that I'm pretty sure it, it had some sort of impact on my children, was playing card games mm-hmm. with numbers. There's a lot of different games, that children's games that involve numbers, where you're working on, and it can be a complex game that adults play, like I think Rummy is a is, is Jim right. Rummy or something. I've played this with my my children when they were younger, and like they're just re- I'm getting wrecked in the game because <laughs> right. they're remembering all the sequences and everything. But it's numbers; you have to have a certain amount and everything. Mm-hmm. And then there's other card games like um, I think like Uno. There's all these ones that are numbers matching and stuff. But that's they're they're feeling comfortable with numbers. Yeah. And when people when you a person can feel comfortable with numbers, then they're less likely to say, I can't do math. You yep. know, cause you've got to be comfortable with numbers. If you're going to do, you know, whether it's your balance on your bank account or your check, you know, whatever it is that you're using them. And most people are not using checks anymore, but like with credit cards to know, okay, I have this amount of money because I find it interesting when you go into a store nowadays and you buy something and you pay in cash and they, you know, you give, um, you buy something that's, you know, 1996 and you give it to 20, 20, well, in my case here, it's euros because I'm in France. You give them the 20 euros and they're, and they're looking for the machine to tell them it's four cents to change. Right. Like, because I mean, the math in my head is running already and I do that as practice. But it's amazing how, you know, somebody says, okay, it's, you know, 1486 and here's 15, it's 14 cents. Like it's, but people don't practice. So they're not comfortable with numbers, but it's practice as well and familiarity. Yeah. And as well as you would say, there's a certain amount of, confidence that you get from practice which helps you build what i love people to remember is that when you're building a new habit there's a snowball effect or a compounding effect and like you have with the the calendar right yeah writing the book right if you start writing just i'm just going to write a paragraph today Mm -hmm. and then you write the paragraph and you're like i want to write another paragraph and you say actually no no time's up you have to do it tomorrow you're like you're excited about it for the next time you know, you're, you've got the motivation and, and you, you build that momentum over time because other people don't want to write a book. They have a great idea, but they're like, I got, I've only got two weeks and I got to write the whole book. Like that's going to push them against the wall. Yeah. And they're not necessarily going to feel very good about what they're doing because they, they feel that the time limit's too pressing. But when you're committed to something long-term, like, you know, you mentioned bef- um, earlier on when we were talking this evening, uh, about when the podcast would get published. Well, I'm in this long term. I've already been doing this 20 years. I'm, you know, I'm going to keep doing this. So <laughs> if you said, oh, it's going to be two years time, it's going to be published. I'm in the long game. It doesn't right. matter. So if you're choosing something when you're going through school um, to, you know, go back to, you know, students with yourself, if you're doing something you really love and it's a long term thing, you're going to have the motivation and you're going to want to do it. And you're going to actually want to do that extra bit of study. Yeah. You know, that you feel you need so that you can properly not just get the grade, but actually what you've learned in your, you know, your stats 101 course, 201 is going to need that. Like, you're going to have to build on that. Like, okay, I'm probably annoying people talking about stats and numbers, but <laughs> it's, 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 it's just a common territory here because I remember going through it in psychology myself too, doing yeah. stats and that. And because I didn't have that fear, I ended up actually tutoring people in stats because I didn't have the fear of math when I entered into it. And it is complex. Stats and psychology is complex yeah. to do that stuff. But uh, there's much more complex mathematics out there as well, too. So, but it really, it depends on how you frame things. I guess we're getting back to how you look at that. And, and your principle there of suggesting that people approach things in a more childlike way mm-hmm. is really, really good. It's really good. Yeah, that's what a lot of people are trying to do with learning now is let's increase that curiosity. So I use a technique. It's called a question formulation technique at the beginning okay. of lessons where I literally just ask students, hey, this is what we're going to talk about memory. What are all mm-hmm. the questions you have about memory? And then they just have to sit for however long, 15 minutes with a group of other students. And they have to write down all the questions that come to their mind. They're not allowed to censor themselves. They're not allowed to think it's a stupid mm. question. Okay. If it comes into their mind, they have to write it down. 
Mm. Um, and then you find, you know, usually your first couple questions maybe aren't that great, but around five to seven questions, you're starting to ask really good ones. Yeah. And the other thing we learn is all the students end up asking the same questions that I would be answering anyways. So typically when we're lecturing, we pose a question like, how does your memory work? And then we mm-hmm. explain it. But the students, like you were saying, have a higher motivation to retain the information when they ask them the question yes. of how does memory yes. work versus when I yes. theoretically pose it. And so yes. if you just have the students come up with their own questions, I mean, all the lectures stay the same because they're all asking the, the right questions yeah. in there. And then they have more connection to it and they feel more in charge of their own learning. And so they retain it a little bit more. This is brilliant. And, and <laughs> it's not and mine. I, I did not come up with the technique. I, I, okay. But it's still, <laughs> it's a brilliant approach because you're, you, you know, what, what, what I, you know, when everybody, as you, when you become a parent, we got no manual. We don't know what we're doing, but what you just said, I can see that with my own children, that when they come to me and ask a question, they're going to retain the answer because they came to mm-hmm. me with the question. If I say, listen, I want to tell you about this. If they, if you've got a good connection, they will listen, but they may not retain it the same way Yeah, because it's not attached to something. It's just like me with the oh cars. Okay. So what do you call that in French? You know, voiture. Okay. <laughs> so like, you know what, so you've already have something that is of interest to you and then you've got a way of connecting it to it. And I, I mean, I always imagined that our brains, the neuron connections and the synapses and everything is kind of like almost like information. You want to attach it together. Uh, and that's how we can learn properly is when we can say, okay, I've learned this. How can I attach it to that? What can I have learned from the past? And even if it's something that's didn't work out, like if somebody has, we all have habits, but some of them are habits we don't want anymore. (laughs) And some of them are habits we want to make. So you have to identify the ones that you don't want anymore. And you have to basically knock the legs out from underneath them. And that could be environmental as well. Mm -hmm. If some people find that, you know what, I'm always down because everybody around me always talks like bad about me or bad about life or has a negative approach. You literally have to change the people you're hanging around around with. I mean, this sounds so obvious and it's not so easy, but it can change your life completely. Now I do know I listened to something actually quite recently and some of these things can be cultural. Mm -hmm. And I listened to actually um, find it quite interesting. There was a couple of, uh, business leaders that were talking about the difference between North America and European approaches to business. And one of them was Reid Hoffman, who was the founder of of LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Another one was Peter Thiel, one of the founders of PayPal. And another gentleman was a French gentleman here, Xavier Neal, who founded the first, uh, not first, no, one of the telecom companies in France who had a very different way of doing business, like giving Mm -hmm. super inexpensive entry level into the mobile network system. So these are very, you know, unfortunately there was no women on the panel, but there was just three people that were talking. But my, my, my point here was that when they were, they were talking about the difference between culture in Europe and North America, they said that when you talk to somebody in North America, the motivation is, I can do this. The taxi driver said, I can be a billionaire. That was one thing that Reed said. And then he said, but when you talk to somebody in Europe in not every country, he said, they say, I have to make change. Is that a good idea? So there can be cultural things that you, if you want to make changes in your life and you're really motivated, look at what's around you mm-hmm. to see, is that something that's part of my family history or my friendship history? Because you have to figure out what it is that's stopping you from moving forward. Could it be cultural? Could it be family? Could it be, you know, and once you kind of become aware of things, you can be much more alert as to how you can change your life. I hope that's valuable to you, but it came up in my <laughs> mind is that in different parts of the world, we think differently because I mean, I live in France, but I don't think the same. I think more like the way I used to think in Canada than I think here. I think very differently. I, I'm right. always like, what can I do to change? How can I grow? So and there's, there's completely different frameworks for people. I mean, I, re, I mean, I have a lot of French friends and they're wonderful people, but they, they sometimes look at the world very differently from me and, I accept them the way they are and they accept me the way I am, but it's, it's different. So there's somebody who moves from one culture in one part of the world and we're, you know, it's not so easy to move around right now, but if somebody moved from, let's say 
name a country, moving to another country where the culture is very different. Because I lived in three different countries so far. So moving from Ireland to Canada to France, all of them have different cultures, yeah. which can be really good to expand your mind because you can see people think differently. And I've traveled over 20 countries. So then I've seen really that we do all think about things very differently. And a lot of it comes from, of course, our personal experience, but also our family and cultural experience. And yeah, then you absolutely. can identify, you know, why is it I cannot change that habit? You know, who am I getting my advice from? You know, am I listening to somebody who really knows what they're talking about psychology like you? Or am I listening to somebody who's just read a couple of books on information and is just kind of pushing it back to me? Who do I, who can I trust? Right. So yeah. that's what as well. Well, and we know from social psychology that the people we surround ourselves with impact our success or pers- whatever you value as success yeah. um, immensely. So mm-hmm. Basically, the adage in psychology is if you want to be something or you want to be someone, you know, that again, going back to that envisioning your future, how do you envision your future? Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to be that a certain type of person or a certain career, you need to start surrounding yourself with people who are doing that. Because once you're around people who are doing what you want, so let's go back to wellness. Let's say one of my goals is to be healthy, to eat healthy Mm -hmm. and exercise more often. Essentially, psychology says that if I surround myself with people who are engaging in healthy behaviors and who are actively trying to be healthy, the likelihood that I will be that healthy version of myself is higher than if I'm surrounding myself with people who aren't. Yes. But it's so hard for us because we think, oh, well, I can change myself. And we don't really always think about changing that environment probably because it's more scary, you know, especially if you're changing, you're having to change friends and, you know, interact with family or cultures different or anything like that. So it can be overwhelming. But I remember coming across something the other day that said, if you want a big change in your life, you're wanting to a whole new career, but you're not changing anything in your environment, you're likely not going to get there. Yeah. And, and uh, what you're saying there too is, you know, so for example, it's hard when people say, for example, in your family or friends that are non-supportive of what you want to do. Mm-hmm. So that could be students in your class where they're like, I want to do this and no one supports me. The best thing you can do, because it's not always easy to just say, I, I'm going to end this friendship, is to reduce the amount of time you spend with that person. Right. So you can reduce it to where it's okay for you you can manage that in your in your mind space that okay i i can spend that much time but i'm not going to go out with them every evening and hang out with them like i used to because this is holding me back but you have to identify those things in yeah. the first place um so and that that takes some introspection but i think a lot of people are much much wiser Brittany, than they, they think they are i think yes. we know intuitively that this is not really exactly supporting me and what you mentioned there about spending time with people that are doing what you want to do, which is really like a part of modeling where you're, Mm -hmm. you're influenced like children model off their parents. You know, the parent can say whatever they want to say. uh, But if they're not actioning the habit, you know, okay, stop when you get to the edge of the road, look both ways, wait till the light's (laughs) green and you cross. And then they see the parent walk straight across the road when the light's red (laughs) at some point in time, this is what they remember. You say, well, hang on a second. There's a, there's a conflict here. And that's actually is is challenging for a child, of course, because they want to idolize the parent or they want to say, okay, the parent's doing the right thing. But if the parent's giving them mixed messages, so a parent wants to make sure that you're, you're doing the same thing. You know, if you want to walk across the road and as we say in English, jaywalk and that, well, don't tell your children not to do that because if you're doing it, they're going to see your behavior. Yeah. So there's, there's an impending risk involved and a responsibility that comes down to it. But yes, it's, it's identifying those things and it rolls forward in time and backwards in time. And I think for anybody who's listening to this and taking the time to listen to other podcasts that you have to offer them, you can change whenever you decide to change. And it's never too late to make the change because yeah. I know where I came from, where I was constantly nervous, stressed out, couldn't speak in front of people, you know, afraid of heights, 
afraid of water, deep water. I, I, you know, I mean, I rock climb now and the, the stuff I would never imagine that I would have done yeah. 10, 15 years ago. And I'm up in a cliff, you know, 30 meters, so 100 feet off the ground. And I'm making the route, I'm clipping in the pins, which if I didn't have mental clarity and focus now, I'd have long since fallen off because <laughs> right. I used to be, af- I used to be afraid of heights. I, I mean, the best example, you know, when you have a, a pier as it goes out and where you've got boats around the pier, I used to have to literally crawl on my belly to get to the edge, to look down to see the water, because I was terrified of just even that elevation. I had the height and I had the water, Right. you know? So you, you, and, and I didn't learn to manage fear of heights in one day. It's an accumulation of the experience of getting, you know, acquiring the skills to be able to rock climb and taking the time to practice Mm -hmm. action. We could do this for anything. You know, we, we, we fumble on a lot of things in life, but we give ourselves time. We forgive ourselves for mistakes we make and we're willing to admit mistakes. And something I was reminded of lately, it's, you know, in relationships, it's, there's one thing about, it's very, very important to be a great listener. But it's also very, very good and very important to communicate. Like you can be a great listener, but you may not be <laughs> telling other people about, you know, what's going on in your mind. Yeah. And that actually makes it hard for those other people to understand you. And that was a piece of wisdom that, that resonated a lot with me because, you know, as much as I love to share, sometimes I won't share everything that I need to share because I don't think necessarily I need to share. But yes, I still got lots of growing to do as well. You know, and when you, when you share with those people around you that are important to you, they get to know you better mm-hmm. and that builds a better relationship. Well, as an educator and a parent in both roles, I've really learned that tact of being able to communicate and not mm-hmm. something you brought up earlier in this episode was that you struggled with kind of telling too much at first, yes. right? So you have to break it down simple or you have to wait till they've experienced something and in both roles as an educator and a parent, that's the hardest part because you're like, Oh, I know all this stuff. Let me throw it at you. Yes. And then students are like, that's too much. I can't retain any of this. I don't understand. And so it's navigating when to let people know certain things, when to like set up the environment so they can figure it out themselves or Mm -hmm. when to just wait and let them figure it out later in their life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, there's so many things I wish I knew as a college student and I want to save all the college students the time, Yes, but you can't like, that's part of growing up and that's part of what they need to learn over time. Yeah. The tool you mentioned though, getting them to figure out questions at the beginning on a topic is a great way of finding out what's important to them at that moment in time. And and that we can take, I mean, life is all really about relationships. And this is what keeps us healthy and strong. When we ask those questions to other people, you know, is there, is there anything that I can do better or do you need any help? And also, big lesson here, if they say, no, I don't need your help, to say, okay, that's fine. Not to impose. Because <laughs> yeah. Can, yeah, like if you say, I'm going to teach you this in psychology or I'm, I'm going to say something in a, you know, in a relationship, where I'm, well, listen, I can do that. You're, you're basically telling the person, I can do it better than you. And yeah. that's not kind at all, um, especially when they didn't ask you for help. Uh, it, but also, they're not going to be re- as receptive. And as you mentioned about um, the students as well, uh, if it's not what they want to learn, you know, they, they, they can add that in later because they'll see maybe when you teach them about memory and they go, oh, yeah, hmm what happens though if I change my sleep patterns? Will that affect me? So then you could start talking about the impact of sleep right. and how our brain works and that when the opening is there. And that's a beautiful way of learning. It's you're inst- instilling the curiosity that you talked about. Mm-hmm. You're also nourishing what you talked about earlier about a, um, a childlike approach, but you know, some people might say, I don't want to be like a child, but in fact, yes, you, you actually do. Because when you're you learning, that, you do, yeah. Yeah, you have to have that open mind, non-restrictive tendency, a confidence that I can go to the moon if I want to, or to Mars, yeah. you know, it's, so what? No one else has done it. You know, I remember, <laughs> you know, uh, I remember a story once, uh, it was a little note that somebody wrote once, and they said, little kids were drawing pictures in class, and the teacher's went over to one of the students, let's call her Judy, and said, Judy, woo-hoo, 
what are, who are you drawing there? And she said, oh, I'm drawing a picture of God. And, and, and the, the teacher said, that's impossible. Nobody knows what God looks like. And the student, the little girl, she said, well, now they will. <laughs> because, you know, this is yeah. the confidence that a child will have is like, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And, and, and then looking at things, uh, you know, when you look at scientists and people, how they learn things overnight, they're curious, you know, why does that exist that way? You know, if there's a, if there's a bird, I think this was with Darwin. He said, it was, if there's a bird that has a tongue that's like, um, I think five inches long. So like 12 centimeters or so long or so. Um, they, it's like, there must be a plant that that bird e e is sucking out of. Right. And in fact, if I'm telling the story correctly, and for those people who know more than me about evolutionary theory in that area, <laughs> they'll correct me quickly. But he did find a plant that coincided with, with the bird. Yeah. So but we, but that curiosity, why is that like that? As against, maybe that doesn't have a function, you know? Um, because like it was human beings, why are we all so very different? There's actually probably an evolutionary reason why, like why do some people have, you know, different colored eyes, you know, why, why is that different color hair, different skin tones, but then you can kind of figure out, okay, we're, we're all human. We just have a different external features. Right. And there's a reason behind that. And all of, everything's beautiful. It is nothing different or less. It's just beautiful. You know, it's, it's a great, um, a great experience if you're curious. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so, we're coming close to time. So I wanted to ask yes. you one last question. Um, this is always the hardest one, but to sum everything up, if you could give kind of one piece of advice to people starting out or people wanting to figure out more about the wonder technique or anything like that, what would your greatest piece of advice be? Well, the best advice I would give to people and they can turn to the wonder technique or turn to whatever motivates them is to understand that learning something new compounds over time mm -hmm. and to be gentle with yourself if you don't learn at the pace that you expect and have the changes happening rapidly because it takes time. And we often can be, we are hardest on ourselves. We think yeah. we can be hard on our people, but we're actually hardest on ourselves. So be, be forgiving in a sense, okay, all right, I didn't do it right today. If there's such a thing as right, but I didn't do it the way I wanted it to be, but I can improve that. Every day, as uh, I know that um, I'm taking a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, who said, every day is a brand new day. So start fresh. Right. And why not? <laughs> That's so. great. And then where can people find more information on the wonder technique or how to get in touch with you? Thank you, Brittany. I appreciate that. And I'll mention some opportunities for some people where I've got a whole bunch of free tools that I give people that pop over to where I place myself online. Really simply, it's the wondertechnique.com. So T-H-E-W-O-N-D-E-R-T-E-C-H-N-I-Q-U-E.com. I probably said that a few times. They can go there. Everything that hangs from there in terms of uh, my videos, my blog, the newsletter, um, all like your podcast will be there. Like everything will be on there. So people can, it's like a placeholder. I like to make right. sure I'm not very active. People are thinking on any other social media with the exception a little bit on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. but so you won't find me on Facebook or not. And this is about time management for me. I want, yeah. and I also make things yeah. simple and easier for people. If they want to find out about me, they can go there. Now, the one thing I wanted to mention two options for people, if they want to learn more about what I share, I do have, um, online courses. I created 10 courses that are specific. One of them is, for example, how to sleep well and wake up energized. Another one I mentioned earlier, how to improve your focus and concentration. Another one, how to improve your resilience. Each one of them is focused with videos and audio and a workbook to help people work on a specific action that they want to work on. Great. And that's all it does like inside of the Wonder Technique. People can find that courses on the website. And as an introduction to my work, if they go online, they sign up, I have a bunch of things, a uh, bunch of things, a bunch of items they get free. Like there's a workbook it's, and it's really, there's 10 steps to improve your health and happiness. Nice. And each one of those is an actionable step that they can work into their lives. 
And also they will get the template for, which um, I don't know if people are going to see video, but I'll show you there. This is a mini motivational card. They get this template. And if you can see that here, and it, there's strategy here. I have clarity in all I do. This is a card you can give to somebody else. You can leave on, you know, in, in a car, in a taxi, whatever. It's positive litter for people to, to inspire other people. And then there's um, a, a better sleeping checklist, a one-page checklist for people to sleep better. That's all free. If you go to my website, yeah. They register for the newsletter, things I used to sell. I just put them all as a package and thought, I want people to get this because I really want everybody as much as possible, even if there's one taste of my work, Brittany, that they have some functional tools that can make their life better. That's great. Thank you. My pleasure. My <laughs> pleasure chatting with you. You have great information. You ask great <laughs> questions, but I loved what you were sharing about the psychology as well, because that's really interesting to me. And I think other people will find what you were sharing about what we've talked about, about children mm -hmm. learning. That is very valuable. Thank you. You're most welcome. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on. My pleasure. I look forward to, to seeing the podcast and keeping connected with you. Thank you for listening to the Career Journey Podcast. Head over to our website at careerjourneypodcast.com for more information and the latest episodes. See you next time.